Well, welcome to another edition of Intentional Conversations. On Intentional Conversations, we seek to interview leaders in men's ministry to help men grow spiritually and help leaders and pastors to reach men in today's culture. Discussing issues men face every day. It is a program where a men's ministry leader interviews leaders in men's ministry. I am Mike Sal, and I thank you for joining me today. And for those of you who have listened to me for any time, you know I often talk about the need for men to have other men in their lives to walk alongside them in spiritual growth. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that Paul told Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What Paul was expecting Timothy to do was to pass the gospel on, which is what we're expected to do. And we uh, we will discuss with our guests today the importance of discipling and can entrust the gospel to faithful men who can teach others also as Paul wanted. My guest on this episode is John Tolson of the Tolson Group. Welcome, John. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Mike. And it's super. I'll tell you, we uh, those of us that's listening out there, John and I met first time uh, just a couple of months ago, actually. Uh, he was a keynote uh, speaker at a conference. I was invited to come down and just kind of watch and observe and because I do conferences also myself, and he and I just connected, and it, it was really great. And he's written right. a book that we'll talk about that book here during our time here, and, and it's really <clears throat> blessed my blessed my heart in so many ways. And I thank John for and his and his team for putting that book together, and we'll, we'll really dive into that. I hope a little bit. Super, super. You, well, let me get let me give you a little bio about John before we really get into this. John <laughs> has taught and spoken nationally and internationally for more than 45 years. He has spiritually mentored hundreds of thousands of adults and students. And in fact, over uh, about 1 million people have uh, been helped through the gathering, which is his ministry, a discipleship ministry he founded. John's deepest desire is to see people become leaders of uh, God created them to be successful in family life, business, and John has served as a faith developer on some of the nation's <clears throat> leading executives, celebrities, and athletes. It's interesting, I thought when I was reading his bio, that it says that he was um, started one of the first teen chaplain programs in the NBA. And he has served several sports teams, including the Houston Rockets, Houston Astros, Houston Oilers, Orlando Magic, and, and most recently, the Dallas Cowboys. He's a basketball player in the past and, and a huge fan. And I thought this was interesting that he holds a, a bet, personal best record of 127 straight free throws. Dude, dude, man. <laughs> how, long, how long did that take? <laughs> Uh, it took a while, but it, it was very exciting. I hated it when I missed 128, though. I wanted to go to 200. <laughs> That's super. Well, John has inspired audiences through his speaking over the years and has been called by the major corporations, including Walt Disney World and IMG, to keynote conferences and seminars. He is the author of Take a Knee, a motivational book based on the locker room messages he gave to the Dallas Cowboys. And he's co co authored The Four Priorities, the book I was just talking about in our intro, which challenges men and women to mature in their faith. He's married uh, to Punky uh, Leonard Tolson in 2001, and he is the father of two grown children uh, by his late wife, Ruth Ann, and has three adorable grandchildren. I don't think they're as adorable as my grandchildren, but we all do. <laughs> what do we? you talk about then? <laughs> John has a master in divinity from Columbia Seminary and is a doctor from ministry, a ministry from Fuller Theological Seminary. And, I, and, and, and dude, I, I, you smart. You're just plumb smart. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, well, I could be faking a little bit, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I appreciate it again for you being on. And I, and, and, and I really want to get dive right into this discussion about the importance of discipling. Why is, it, why is discipling so important? Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, I want to back it up just a little bit and lead right into that. Okay, uh, that's fine. And with all the years that you've spent working with men, uh, I spent probably, I think, about 18 years working with high school students. The last mm. place was here in Dallas, Texas, uh, in an area called Highland Park, which is a very affluent area. And one of the things I noticed when I was here in Dallas, 
in Highland Park, when a kid would come to know Christ, and when they went home to be encouraged in their faith, if they got any encouragement at all, it was from mama, not daddy. Yeah. Not that yep. daddy was not, a, you know, happy about that, but he had no game. Yep. He didn't know what to do to help his kid who'd come to know Christ. Number two, during that time, there were more women in the pews than men. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking around, where are men? Where are the daddies? Where are the husbands? Where are the leaders in the city? Number three, most pastors I knew did not make it an intentional thing for themselves to spend time grooming men to be great men for the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And, and study was done back then, which really had a big, big impact on what I've done the last 43 years of my life. And it said that in a family, if the daddy's not plugged into the Lord, there's about a 22, 23% chance that the kids and the others in the family would come to know the Lord. But if he was plugged in, it almost got up to 90% chance that mm -hmm. they would come to know Christ. Mm -hmm. So it was during that time that I really um, said, I've got to do something with men. And there wasn't much going on around the country at that time. There was no promise keepers. There was no iron sharpens iron. There were one or two little things going on, but it, it was mainly reaching believers, not reaching non-believing men around the nation. And my heart was really getting after and going after the guy that didn't know Christ and then grooming and developing him, which I'll get into now. So that's what I've done for 43 years, working primarily with men and leaders, uh, men who are leaders around the country. So you want me to get into the disciple making? Well, I do. I want you, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's say, let's, let's kind of educate our audience a little bit. I know they've probably have heard the word discipling thrown out and, and right. mentioned a lot of times, especially in days of course, it's only been probably in the last couple of decades that is really taught regularly in, in, yeah. in the ch local church. Anyway, <clears throat> let's help out people real quickly to understand what is disciple making. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting in Matthew 28, 19, the last words out of Jesus's mouth and last words are lasting words, mm -hmm. very important. And he said, go, or as you are going, make disciples. Mm -hmm. But the question then becomes, what does that mean? And I think that, first of all, the disciples understood when he said that, that no one raised their hands of the disciples and said, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. They had experienced it. Yeah. They had seen it modeled. They knew what to do. Yep. Uh, but in order for us to understand that, uh, we've got to go back and we've got to look at the New Testament to see what it says about that. And actually, there's a lot in the Old Testament about it, but it doesn't use the word disciple. But you mentioned the key passage, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things you have heard from me, Timothy, uh, Paul's saying this, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust or make a deposit to faithful men who will be qualified to do the same with others also. So if you look up the 269 times that the word disciple is used in the New Testament and do all your research, drop all that research in a funnel, out of the bottom of the funnel, drop three things it means. Three things. Mm -hmm. Number one, a disciple is a learner. A lot of people I work with in Dallas pride themselves in knowledge and in learning and getting more information. And in and of, of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But biblically speaking, though, true learning only takes place when it changes how I live. So I haven't learned it just because I've heard some information and maybe taken some notes or read a book. Learning means I've got to be being transformed by the things that I'm hearing and putting into my life. So true learning means change behavior. The what do you say? To thing, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I was thinking of, you know, we talk about learning. What do you say to people who say, well, I'm in a discipleship relationship because I'm in some school class. Yeah. I would say that is an information dump. Okay. That, that is, and it's, that's important. Yeah. But often in Dallas, and, and like you said a while ago, 
or in the last couple of decades, there's more and more conversation about the word or term or concept of discipling. Mm -hmm. But I still think there is amazing amount of misunderstanding of what that means. Mm -hmm. In Dallas, Texas, the typical definition is we back up our biblical theological truck and, and the title of our conference is Disciple Making, and we dump out all of our information on your church or your conference, and we pull off, and we say, we discipled you. That's not discipling. That's an information dump. And it may be great information, biblical information, correct theological information, right. but that is not disciple making. Right. So that goes to the second thing. A disciple is not only a learner, but a follower. So it comes with the idea, the term follow comes from an idea of an adhesive. It's something that sticks to something else. In this case, it's a person who's after Jesus, who's walking with him. Jesus is the leader. The follower is sticking to him. Mm. Jesus calls the shots. The other fellow is willing and hopefully progressively growing in doing what Jesus says to do. So the learning and a continual following and the following, just a brief comment here, that the, the demand of following Jesus are very challenging. This is not for, for people who are faint of heart. Oh, Number no. three. That's right. <laughs> Number not. three, you, you know that. And I know that <laughs> by experience. But number three, this is where we've missed it in our understanding of disciple making. I think most people that use the term, have read the term, have studied the term, say, yep, we got to learn and we've got to follow Jesus, do what he said. But the third thing that discipling means, and it goes right back to your second Timothy 2 2, is a disciple is a reproducer. And reproducing means I take somebody on. I build into them what we call a faith foundation. As we meet together over a period of time and go through this process, the two of us are building a friendship. So it's highly relational. And one of the things men need in our nation, they need a buddy. And this is giving somebody a buddy and teaching them over a period of time to be a buddy to somebody else. But as I go through that process with someone, I'm getting them ready not only to live effectively the foundation of faith that we're going to build into them, but to build on that foundation the rest of their life. All yeah. I'm doing is a foundation builder. And right. what we're finding is most men and women in this country sitting in churches do not have a foundation built. They've got little scattering of thoughts here, ideas here, jerk a verse here, whatever, but no cohesive foundation built in their life that they can articulate and live by. So what we're up to in this disciple making then is to produce learners, living the truth, following Jesus, and reproducing that in the lives of others so that that exponential, reproductive, multiplying effect happens. That is what Jesus was looking for. And well, you know, I, must, and I yeah. must say, it's happening on only a handful of churches in America. Yeah, I think we, uh, when you and I were talking uh, sometime back, you asked me that question, how much did I think? And I told you, I told you there was probably less than 8% of the churches that are doing that. Is that True. If there are eight percent, if there are eight percent, I'm going to be jumping up and down singing hallelujah. <laughs> okay. I don't well, think okay, so. It's many. less than that. Okay, less I than that. I think there and, are discipleship and, groups where people sit around and share content, share their lives, and all that. These big churches in Dallas have life groups with fifteen yeah. or twenty people and all that. That is not disciple making. What I ask yeah. those people is, okay, so who in your fifteen uh, uh, people in your life group? Who are those individuals taking on outside that group and discipling them? Yeah. Answer, no one. Nobody. Nobody. That's right. That's right. And it's hard to get them to understand the importance to do that. I know I know from my own self, I grew up in the church. You know, I, I, I can honestly say I've known nothing else as far as <clears> life <throat> except the church, because that's where I, where I came from. And even though I came to Christ at 17 years of age, nobody really discipled me you know yeah. uh, i was just getting information information dump as you said 
but it wasn't until I was 50 years old wow. that I had a, had a man come and tap me on the shoulder one Sunday morning, mm. right after the service and said, Mike, I want you to join me and a couple of other guys this Saturday morning. Let's start walking through the Bible a little bit. Mm. So I agreed to do that. And I stayed with that man for three years. And I'll tell you something, John, I learned more in those three years and the importance about me pouring my life into other people, like the second Timothy two, two talks about that I did all those other years that I have been in church. And that's what, uh, that's what our people are missing these days. It is. It's not happening. So why would you like, so why, me, why, would you like me to mention some of the benefits of that? All right, go well, ahead, we're gonna get to, yeah. Go ahead and talk about that. Cause I was going to ask you that question. What is the benefits of making disciples? Okay. I just listed some of these things the other day. First, number one, it's doing what Jesus said to do. Right. There's a great reward that comes of internal satisfaction of knowing I'm doing what Jesus said to do. <laughs> Number two, relationships are deepened. That we oh, have so many. Yeah, we that's have so fact. many superficial uh, cocktail talk, sports talk, uh, times with people with no depth. So relationships are deepened. Number three, people. Um, are cared for. You know, when I meet with my guys each week, I got right now three one-on-ones every week. I think last year I had seven one-on-ones and all these men made a certain commitment, which I'll get into later. But let me tell you something, when they come in here in my office and I'm looking over at where I usually sit and they sit right in front of me, we got a big window where we can look outside. Let me tell you, we get after it. And that's not gonna be happening in most settings. So those people are cared for. Guy was coming in uh, about nine months ago, and he was trying to figure out whether he should marry this girl or not. Well, the next month or so, every time we met, that was one of the things we talked about. So it's real life stuff. Now, we have other things that we're going through beside that, but it's just not a matter of getting our nose in the Bible or a book and and, and religiously, legalistically going through that. We apply this to daily life. I think another one is all areas of our lives uh, are impacted. And if we look at the book that I'm going to show you in a minute, we put together as our map, roadmap, to disciple people, to disciple people, it touches on every major area of a man's life. So yeah, that's another that. practical thing. As a well, let, me, let, me, let me stop you. Right, let me stop you right there. Let's back up just a little bit. You talk about people sure. caring for, and you were talking about that young man that you were you were helping him to walk through a decision making of his life. That comes from developing that deeper relationship that you were talking about. Exactly. You know? That's not going to come on a superficial relationship. No, uh, and so, yeah, look, those guys have got to feel comfortable to be able to to share those kinds of questions they may have in their lives and know that they they, they can't they won't do that with just anybody no, there's so, a trust factor there that has to be built yep yeah exactly yep, right yep. so okay. then another one is uh as a disciple maker i continue myself when i'm discipling somebody to mature myself i keep growing every time i meet with a guy i am being challenged to be at my best to give my best to be prepared and to be number one, living out the stuff I'm trying to get him to get. <laughs> and I don't do that a hundred percent, but I'm working on it every day. Yeah. So that's so, another one. Yeah. That, that's so, so let me comment about that. I think one of the reasons we've got such great immaturity in our churches in America is because the people have not been discipled. You are not going to be discipled by, I don't care if you've got the rock star preacher on the planet who preaches great exegetical expository messages every Sunday. That, that is not discipling. That's information. Mm -hmm. The relationship aspect along with the information, that's going to be the thing that begins to change. So I continue to grow mature and I think we've got a, we've got gross immaturity sitting in the pews in our churches. I did yeah, a talk yeah. not long ago, and the title of it was, Are Christians Destroying America? Wow. And my thesis was, yes, they are. I don't blame the pagans. I blame the Christians. If we've and got a hundred... 
And that is if why we got a hundred plus million Christians in the church, where are you? It's the believers not showing up, not being prepared with their immaturity. They've got no game and I'll blame it on men. I'm, and the women are, are for the most part way ahead of men in impacting mm. the planet for Christ. Mm. Where are the men? Yeah, where are the men? That that is so true. We talk about that a lot of times, trying to get men to understand the importance of their leadership roles. And it's because yeah. they have not been properly discipled. They have not been a disciple. That yeah. is the missing step. Let me give you a couple more. Uh, to know that I am a significant part of a worldwide movement for Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, what else? I mean, you know, every man, I think, wants to do something that makes him sense of, I'm making my life matter. Well, to know that I'm a part of God's plan to change the planet, it doesn't get any better than that. Here's another one. All the things a pastor wants in a church is realized through disciple making. So I was mm. in Mississippi about three weeks ago. One evening, I'm meeting in a little town called Kosciuszko, Mississippi, north of Jackson, an hour and a half. A pastor from Jackson, drove me up there, and we had been with this pastor in Jackson, oh, I don't know, four months ago. Well, this pastor, through our training and encouragement, has become a disciple-making crazy man. And as we drove up, this is what he said. He said, John, let me tell you. He said, most, and he's, a, he's in a Baptist church, and he said, and his church is rocking with disciple-making. But he said, John, most churches, if they if the pastor wants the people to learn how to be givers, then they'll have a weekend conference on stewardship. If they want them to share their faith, then they will have a weekend conference on evangelism. If you want people to sign up to do stuff in the church to help out, have a weekend on serving. He said, if you disciple people and you have people discipling people, you don't have to have those conferences. He said, in the last four or five months, I've had people coming to me. What pastor, where do you need me to give some money? Pastor, where can I help out on Sunday morning? Pastor, um, uh, I, I, where do, do you have some people that really need to hear the gospel? I'll go get them. So in other words, he's saying when you disciple, you are equipping people to want to give all those things as a part of living the faith out every day. But when you don't have that, then you're twisting people's arms. You're trying to coerce them to do something. You're giving a lollipop or a candy bar. If you need this, Jesus, listen, and it don't work long term. You may get a short term payback, but the long term deal is go deep, make a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple. And yeah. they, by God's grace through the Holy Spirit, will want to be doing these things. So we yeah. got to go. We got to go to disciple making. Yeah, that's good. yeah, and you know, uh, John, one of the things I see in my travels when I sit down and talk to pastors a lot of times, and, and and you can you can rebuke me on this if you want to, if I'm if I'm off base, it's often I find that pastors themselves have never been discipled. Oh, I would say ninety five percent of pastors have never been discipled. Ninety five percent. So I'm not going to mention this man's name. Mm -hmm. But about five years ago, I discipled here in Dallas, the son-in-law of one of the most famous Bible teachers in America and probably the world. Mm -hmm. I wanted a meeting with this man. So my friend that I was discipling set up a luncheon in another city. We went and met with this man one evening. He was gracious to have us in the home after we took him to dinner to his favorite, favorite restaurant. And... I took about 15 or 20 minutes and gave him a few thoughts on disciple making the learner follow what reproducer this pastor. If I said his name, everybody in this country knows him. Every pastor knows who he is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so he put his hand on my arm and he said, John, that thing you just said about somebody discipling you, no one ever did that with me. He said, I'm 83 years old now. No one ever walk with me. Number two, he said, I have never done that with anyone in my life. Mm. How many times do you think he preached through Matthew 28, 19? Uh, 
83 years old. He's probably been a pastor for most of his life. I'd say uh, quite a few. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. So let me tell you another story. That's, that's, that's the kind of the downside. Let me give you the upside. So one of my dearest friends here in Dallas is named Richard, Richard Ellis. Started a church 25, 26 years ago, downtown Dallas, inner city church. He's a sixth generation Baptist preacher. Church is third white, third black, and third Hispanic. It's alive. So he said, when I was 28 years old, I finished seminary in Fort Worth. And I cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, I love you and I know you, but I cannot live this Christian life and be a minister if you don't give me some help. I need some help. Mm -hmm. And so he said, he started praying, Lord, give me somebody to help me. So he goes to Jackson, Mississippi, not long after that, a meeting with a bunch of preachers. They're milling around, getting ready for a meeting to start. And he looks across the room. There's this old man standing there looking at him. He doesn't know the old man. Old man comes over. He said, my name's, my name's Claude. He said, well, my name's Richard Ellis. Old man says to go outside and talk. They go outside three hours later. The old man looks at him and says, well, Richard, now that I've heard you, let me tell you what I do. I walk with people. That's another way of saying I disciple men. Mm -hmm. And I think you're worth discipling. Mm -hmm. So for the next three years, this old man gave his life to Richard and Richard cannot tell you this story today without weeping because mm. he said, I would not be here today if that old man hadn't given me two things that no one, my seminary professors, my pastor friends, my, even my parents, he gave me two things. He gave me time and he gave me truth. He didn't just give me time and no truth or truth and no time. He gave me himself time and he gave me truth, and it changed my life. And that's why Richard Ellis is a disciple-making pastor. Oh, man, man. Well, John, we need to take a break right here. And and I, 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 I'm just uh, blown away with this conversation we're having because I, this is something you and I could talk about for quite some time. But we're going to take a break right now, folks. And uh, and we're, we've got uh, John uh, Tolson from uh, the Tolson Group on with us talking about disciple making and how important that is to be in our lives. And we will be back in just a moment to talk more about that. Stay tuned. You're listening to Intentional Conversations with Mike Salen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to these podcasts. If you're interested in knowing more about me and what I have learned over the years working with men, check out my book, The Call, A Journey into Men's Ministry. You can find the book on Amazon.com or on BarnesandNoble.com. Check out the website, CapeFearMen.net. You'll find many recommended resources to help you and the men in your church grow in Christ. You can also follow my blog and discover events Cape Fear Men will be hosting throughout the year. You can even schedule a time to talk with me about your men's ministry or developing a mentoring relationship. If you enjoy these programs, I would ask you to do two things. One, share this program with your friend. And two, consider helping to keep these broadcasts coming to you by giving to Cape Fear Men. You can give by going to capefearmen.net and click on the Give to Cape Fear Men button at the top of the page. Thank you in advance for your donation. Now, back to the program with this week's guests. Well, welcome back to Intentional Conversations. We're on the uh, on the air with John Tolson and the Tolson Group, and we have been thoroughly enjoying our conversation, talking about disciple making and what disciple making is and what it's all about, and some of our experiences <laughs> in that area. And uh, I'm going to uh, kind of turn the tables. We've been talking about why it's important to disciple making and why and what is disciple making. Now let's 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 talk to John a little bit. I'm going to ask him the question. All right, I understand the importance, and I understand what the scripture says I need to do. How do I do it? What about what I got to do next? Well, there are a couple ways to come at, at that question, it's, and that that is a very critical question. Number one, I've got to, even though maybe I've never been discipled uh, or discipled anybody else, uh, I've got to come to a determination that if Jesus commanded this to go make disciples, Matthew 28, 19, 
it's for all believers, not a gifted few. Mm -hmm. You never see disciple making mentioned as a spiritual gift of the New Testament. It's a command by Christ. So I got to decide, do I want to be obedient? It's really an obedient issue. Am I going to obey him or not? Yeah. And even though we may feel incompetent and we're not ready, you can get ready. As a pastor, as a lay person, I mean, I could tell you stories that are people that are making disciples that never, ever thought they could do this, that are crushing it and impacting people's lives who then are impacting people's lives. Mm -hmm. So the first thought here is, and getting started, you got to remember that disciple making is a lifestyle. Pastor, it's not a program to add to your program list. If you got a list of activities in your church, you might call them programs. You need to put an overarching mark on top of all that. And at the top, the overarching mark is this multiplying disciple making. It is the number one thing we're called to do. And yet when I went to seminary, I went to two seminaries and never was one course even offered on how to do that. Not one. So uh, how do you get started? Well, if you're a pastor, I would say, number one, go find you one person and start discipling them. Go find you a man. I have a, a guy in Jackson, Terry Fant. I mentioned him a while ago. He heard me speak in Jackson about five months ago, actually it was longer than that. And there were 600 pastors and I gave seven or eight minutes on disciple making, learner, follower, reproducer, go back and listen to the first part of the podcast. So uh, he got a book. We gave everybody there a book. He goes home he, and I said, man, how'd you get started? He said, well, I went back and sat in my office. He said, I got a thriving church. I love to preach and teach. I love my people. We're the third fastest growing Baptist church in the state of Mississippi. He said, but all of a sudden I'm sitting there after I heard you. And I said, how did I miss this? How did I miss this disciple making? This is what he said to do. I missed it. So what did I said? So what'd you do? He said, I picked a guy. I went through this with him. He had a book. I had a book. We went through it. And then he took a guy and I took a new guy. He said, we've got over 70 people in our churches right now that are taking one other person going through this. He said, we've never preached on it. I've never put anything in the bulletin about it, but they're just doing it. He then he invited me to come to do a, one of the things we call a disciple making summit. They had about 200 people sign up to go through the six hour deal, had me preach twice on Sunday morning, just about disciple making. And we're, now this church is on a country road outside of Jackson, Mississippi. If you look from the parking lot across the street, all you see is bales of hay. There are no homes, no houses. They're out that in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. That little church on Sunday morning and two services had over a thousand people. Oh my gracious. The assistant called me the other day. We need more books. She said, we've got people standing in line wanting to be discipled. Oh my gracious. Okay. So pastor, that's the simplest way to start. You don't have to start some big program and pair people up and do all that stuff. Just take somebody. Just do it and see what happens. Number two, a way to start is have us come in and do our training for you, your officers and your key leaders in your church, like Sunday school teachers, uh, any, anybody on your staff, we've right. got the six hour deal, which talks about what is disciple making? Why is it important? What's an overview of it? What happens if I don't do it? What happens if I do do it? What are the characteristics of a disciple? What are the priorities of a disciple? And what are some of the finer points of like, how do you pick somebody? What do you do with them? How do you get started, et cetera? We cover it all so that everyone there has what they need to begin. And there's more to it than this. If you're just a, a, a if you're a men's minister, my goodness, <laughs> every men's minister in this country ought to be the number one thing other than bringing a, a guy to Christ is building, multiplying, disciple making. And I've Amen. read 
I started one of the first men's ministries in this country, the gathering of men mm -hmm. years ago when there was nothing, there was no, no Tony Dungy or any of these other people doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. I know I'm, I'm a pioneer mm -hmm. <laughs> and oh, I made man. a lot of mistakes, but we did a lot of good stuff too. Yeah. Now we've got iron sharpens iron. We got other things going on, but even with that, if I'm not, if I'm not preparing and equipping men's ministries to disciple people, to disciple people, I am missing a great opportunity. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, if you I mean, want to yeah. change men, the men I disciple, I can, I can put a man here who's been discipled and discipling others and a man who hadn't. And without them telling me whether they have or haven't been discipled, I can tell you by looking at them where they've been discipled. There's a oh, yeah. quality and a depth and an excitement about Jesus and impacting the planet that you can't get any other way. Well, you know, you hit on something earlier, uh, I think in, in the first half of, of what we're talking about, about the uh, the importance of, of being discipled or, or, or the pastors having their people discipled is because when you have a church full of people who have been discipled properly, Right. And and they're growing in their faith, and and they're 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 becoming more and more like Jesus. You know, as Paul told us in his writings, he says we're to imitate Jesus. You know, and he he was even bold in one of his letters to the Corinthians about saying, "You imitate me, and you'll imitate Christ." You know, which is what we should be doing. You know, we should be teaching them to do that. Is when you do have ministry needs that crop up. You know, when you have, when you need a teacher, you know, a Sunday school teacher, let's say, based on whatever you may call them in your church, you have a, a family in need out there that needs help with something. You need um, disaster relief people to go to work in some You don't have to beg for people to do it. It's because their faith has grown so much. They want to put their faith to work and they'll just come and. I think you shared it in the first half of talking I about a guy coming, coming and say, pastor, what can I do for you? You know, That's right. and, uh, and you'll, 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 that'll be another problem you will have, but it's a good problem. <laughs> you yeah. have so many yeah. people coming in wanting to do stuff. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Well, so I think that, um, I think that to give you a, just a, another little thought on that, if you want to get started, you got to have some training we can help you with the training. That's what we do. We have a thing called a disciple making summit. And if you can, will contact us. We'll tell you what that's all about. We, we, we are working with a seminary here in Dallas. Now we are uh, discipling their students all over the United States. Right. This seminary is known as the Harvard of, of theological schools in the nation. Right. Right. They have finally gotten with it and we're doing that. And now they've got branches around the country. Now I'm getting ready to go to those branches of the seminary to train their staff and their, their students of disciple making so that when they get out of seminary and that they start hitting the road as a pastor or whatever, they're going, this is, they're going to be their DNA. We're going to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So we've got the training and you want me to say something about the book? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So before I moved to Dallas, um, I, I knew I was coming here. I was in Orlando and what I was going to do here for the rest of my life was to equip and train people to make disciples, to make disciples. I said, but the average person in the pew, if I hand them my Bible, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a, this is the number one book, but go disciple somebody they're going to seize up. They're going to choke on that. Mm -hmm. But if I take out of that key things and make it simple where anybody could understand it, whether you're a nuclear physicist or a plumber, you could understand that. So that's the idea behind the four priority. What mm -hmm. the four priorities based on is Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Second commandment, like the first, love your neighbor, you love yourself. So there are four commitments that come out of that passage. Number one, your personal commitment to Jesus. How do you make it sizzle? So we got seven chapters on that. How to make it come alive. Mm -hmm. Number two, he says, love your neighbors, you love yourself. We think the second priority is love yourself. And the thesis behind that is you will only love your neighbor to the degree you love yourself, 
and you'll only love yourself to the degree you know how much God loves you. So we lay out what God thinks about you in this. And then we take Luke 2.52, the same way Jesus grew, love yourself by taking care of yourself physically, mentally, socially, emotionally. So we've got chapters on all of that. Seven chapters. Probably and you know, two. you know what's what's interesting about that book. You know, as I read through it and from uh, getting familiar with it, was the fact so often when we look at discipleship, other discipleship materials, they typically only deal with the. I guess the best way for me to say it is the spiritual, biblical aspect of, of what your life needs to be, and they don't touch on the the physical need of the individual. They don't do it. This is a yeah. very unique book. They talk about assurance of salvation, study the Bible, prayer life, having good friends that love the Lord, go to church. We need to do all that. We do yeah. all that in here, but we do more than that. We try to, we try to, it's an old business axiom, scratch where people itch. If we're not scratching with the gospel where people itch and making it down to earth practical in their marriages, in their parenting, we do all that in here. Yeah, because I, I know when I was reading it, I mean, you got into the emotional aspect of how you respond to things, uh, eating habits. Talk, you know, I talked a little bit about that. You talked about your mental attitude, about where, the, the, how, how you process stuff in your life. That's right. I yeah. mean, you you really get into the heart of the individual, the deep soul of the individual, so so they can so they can really understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I had a 52 year old man come in here yesterday at three o'clock. One of the guys I'm discipling, he said he picked up his book and he said, "John, this has changed my life." He said, "We think people know this stuff. They don't know this stuff." Even the people sitting in the best churches in America, they don't know this stuff. No, this is a no. game changer. Yeah. Not because I got my name on it, and Larry Kreider, who helped me with it, has his name on it. It's what's inside, and it's from this, yeah. just broken down where everybody can understand it. And, We've but, got and for those for those of you who don't know what this is, because you don't see the video that I'm seeing right now, he's holding his Bible up. That's what <clears> he's talking about. That's what the this yeah. is. That's so, the big book. That's the good yeah. one. <laughs> but yeah, this is a pretty good one too. Because yeah, it's that, based that, on the Bible. Yeah, it's and it is. It is based. It helps you to fully understand that. Um, well, John, you've talked about several several times about contacting you. How can they contact you? And okay, uh, I'm gonna give you a couple of things here. If you want to send it a note to our email, it's John at the Tolson Group.com. John at the Tolson Group, that's T-O-L-S-O-N. That's all one word, the Tolson Group.com. And you can go to our website and see all about what I'm talking about and just go to the Tolson Group.com. And uh, if you want a phone number, you can call our office at 214-521-0928. 214-521-0928. And what we do, what my purpose is, is to train and equip ministries, pastors, churches, individuals to start discipling. That's what we do. And we've got illustrations from people's lives. I mean, if we had the time, I could give you, in fact, if we got a minute or two, tell me in a minute, and I'll give you one illustration that will knock you out. Go for it. I mean, okay. uh, we, we, do, we do need to start wrapping this up, but go ahead and do that. If, uh, okay, so let me tell you about Ed. So I'm looking out of my office window in Dallas, and to my right, there's a gigantic high rise. It's called the Athena. And about four years ago, a friend said, there's a man that wants to meet you. His name's Ed. He hears you're serious about disciple making. So we set a lunch up, and I go to meet my friend, and this man whom I'd never met in walks my friend. Nobody's with him. About 10 seconds later through the door comes this man on a walker. We sit down, we begin to talk. He said, my name's Ed. I've been a lawyer here in Dallas for 42 years. At that point, he was 91 years old. Wow. He said, and he had that gruffness about him about like a lawyer. He said, well, son, 
tell me about that disciple making. I said, okay. So I give him a little overview. Then I give him a book and I said, why don't you read the book and then call me up and we can discuss where we go from here. A week later, he calls me, John just said, read that book. It's good. It's real good. What do I do now? I said, I thought you read the book. If you read the introduction in chapter 28, it tells you what to do. Are you sure you read the book? Oh, yeah, I read it. I read it. Okay. okay. So I give him a few summary tips. I said, you need to have some people. So I told him who to pick, how to pick, all that stuff. Every week for a month, he calls me. Am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? I said, yes, sir, you're doing it right. So about two months later, I went over to his high rise on the 17th floor, called him up, said, come on over. I said, I want a report. So we're sitting down. I said, give me what you got. 91 going on 92. He said, I got five guys. They come up here one at a time to the 17th floor. They all have this book, the, the four priorities. They made a commitment on the front end, just like you told me. I said, I can't take you on unless you're committed to begin with. That When we're done, you'll take at least one man and do the same with them as I've done with you, and you'll do it the rest of your life. This is not mm. a program. This mm. is the game plan that mm. Jesus gave us. Mm. And so I'm thinking, I wonder how old these guys are, probably 80 or 90 years old. Mm -hmm. I said, how old are they, Ed? He said, well, three in their 30s, one's 50, one's 60. Mm. There you go. So a month later, he called, said, John, I'll be in the hospital. He said, I was feeling a little weak, and they put a pacemaker in. I'll be back tomorrow, and the guys are starting to come up again. Two week, two months later, he called and said, John, will you do me a favor? I said, Ed, I'd do anything for you. I've never met anybody like you. Mm. He said, if I die before I get these five guys done and out there, will you take them on, finish them up, and get them out in the city doing this? I said, you got my promise. So he graduated them in 2021, and he right then was 93 years old. Okay. He said, John, I got three more. We start in February. We got to do that Zoom thing. And I don't like that Zoom thing, but I guess it's better than nothing. 93. <laughs> three months later, I get a phone call. Ed had graduated and gone home to be with the Lord. Here's the point. Mm. How many people do you know at 93 years old were having that kind of impact? So I'm at a, at a summit that we're teaching at Dallas Seminary. Rooms packed. Right-hand table, I tell that story that I just told you about Ed. This guy raises his hand, this young guy. He said, you know that story you just told about Ed? I was one of his five. Wow. And these are my, and these are my two guys that I'm building into now and discipling. Oh, man. That's wild. That's why I go all day long telling you these stories. These are life changing. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I just go yeah. say it impacts your marriage, it impacts your personal life, your work life, everything. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I and I wish we could have all day long to do that. John, we're just going to have to have you on again to talk about some of those stories and encourage people and and uh, and see if we can uh, really get uh, some movement going on in. Uh, around the country. I know you've already got it going on and uh, we but, need it uh, more though. We need it more, and, Mike. And uh, so it, and it, now's the time in our history. Now, I think there's mid, never been a riper time than now in our nation. Well, you know, part of my story is uh, I lost my dad when I was 14 years of age. He went into eternity to 1968 when I was 14 and I didn't have anybody in my life, even though I was in church. You know, yeah. um, I didn't have anybody in my life to to pour into my life from a manly standpoint. Yeah. And so I struggled a lot. If I'd had somebody like that who could start pouring my life in my late teens, I'd have made some better decisions in my life. It's a game no changer. That's right. Listen, we've, we've got people, and I lost my dad too, not through that, but he left when I was two yeah. years old. I never met him in my life. He was gone. My stepdad came when I was about seven. He had no idea how to be a dad. So I didn't have that either. This is a game changer. And it people is. listening to this, I hope you will let us help you. This is what we do. And Mike's facilitating this. He believes in this. He's doing this. This is all we do so we can help you. 
Amen. Amen. Well, John, we are coming up on our time and, and, and man, we could just continue to do this and, and we will have you back on probably in another couple of months or something like that. And we'll talk some more if, it, if you're willing to do that I and uh, see what we can do, what kind of response we got. And so, so to speak, but can folks, I make one uh, final statement? Sure. Go ahead. Here it is. More time with fewer people makes greater impact for Christ. It's kind of like the, the, the it's kind of like the, um, which would you rather have, you know, a million dollars or a penny a day and double that penny every day. Right. You know, <laughs> to, disciple, you know making, we gotta, disciple making beats everything. Yeah. It, we think it, we it got beats. to, uh, right. think we got to reach a hundred, hundred, a thousand or several thousand people at one time when it really only takes one person and get that one person to commit to go find somebody else and just keep them multiplying. That's the cycle. That's right. That's the cycle. That's it. That's it. Well, folks, if you want to get up with John, just email him at john at the Tolson group.com or go out to uh, www.thetolsongroup.com and uh, and see what he could. John will be happy to talk with you. I have no doubt in my mind about that. they will get up with you, help you get started with what true discipleship is all about. And, uh, and I know a lot of you out there are, are trying to do discipling, but you've never really been trained yourself. And this is a great way to be able to, yeah. to learn what Jesus really meant when he said, go make disciples. And, uh, but John, I appreciate, appreciate Thank everything you you're doing. And, and uh, it, you know, you've, you've been, you've, we've only known each other for two, two or three months and you've already impacted my life. I'm going to tell you that now. So, oh, so. Thank you, my <laughs> friend. I'm grateful for you and our friendship and what you're up to. Yeah, amen. Well, folks, I appreciate you listening to us with intentional conversations. And uh, I hope that you will tune in to us again later because uh, uh, we'll have some interesting conversations going on with some other people. And uh, hopefully we'll have John back on in a couple of a couple of months and we'll continue this discussion of Disciple Maker because it's so important and I, and I love it. So I encourage you to check it out in, in a few months. So thank you, John, for being with me today. You've provided some great information, I think, for us to really, really evaluate ourselves and understanding if, we're, if we are truly doing what God's called us to do. So if you need more information, you know how we've shared with you how to get up with him, just email him at john at the tolsongroup.com or go to the Tolson Group, tolsongroup.com website and you'll get that information. Well, God bless you. And we'll see you all the next time. Or we'll talk to you all. We probably won't see you, but we'll talk to you all <laughs> on, on uh, Intentional Conversations with Mike Sandlin. God bless. Thank you for listening to Intentional Conversations with Mike Sandlin. Intentional Conversations is a production of Cape Fear Men, a men's ministry coalition. Cape Fear Men is a 501c3 organization operating under Ministry Alliance. To learn more about Cape Fear Men and how Cape Fear Men can help you reach the men of your church, or if you want to know more about what we discuss with these programs, go to capefearmen.net. If you'd like to speak to me directly, email me at mike.sandlin at capefearmen.net. But for now, I will leave you with this blessing. I pray God will give you a rock to stand on, a brook to drink from, and a tree to shade you. This is Mike Sandlin saying God bless, and I hope you will join me again on the next Intentional Conversation with Mike Sandlin.